Hey everyone, thanks for joining me. Today I want to talk about recognizing and overcoming culture shock. In today's business world, the earth is flat as all get out. Don't get me started on the flat earth thing. No, 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 no. What I simply mean is everything is global, everything is international, and borders when it comes to the global economy, well, borders just plain don't exist. So this means that we are going to be working with folks from all over the world on more or less a daily basis, which means we are going to be experiencing culture shock. And I'm just going to tell you from my own personal experience, culture shock is ugly. It's hard. It's difficult. It's painful. I have been very, very fortunate in my career. I have lived in five countries. I speak three languages. I've traveled and worked in probably 16 more countries or so. So I have had the benefit of experiencing culture shock so many times. And I can tell you that while it is a very, very, very painful experience, the beautiful relationships we can build and the performing teams waiting for us on the other side of culture shock are absolutely sublime and beautiful and tremendous. So we want to learn how to get through this as quickly as possible. All right, so that's what we're doing today. Let's get started. First of all, I want to talk about the characteristics of culture shock. What does culture shock look like? And viewer discretion advised because this stuff is ugly. And furthermore, I want to go on the record and just stay outright. I am going to say for the whole world, I have experienced all of this. And I am not proud of that, but I'm conveying this to help you understand that this is real, this is normal, and there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, so with that in mind, let's check this out, man. All right, so characteristics of culture shock. Sadness, loneliness, melancholy, depression. Oh my holy heck, yes. So one of the places I used to live was France. I lived in France uh, when junior year of high school. And uh, I, was, I was there for a year, and then I'd go back and forth from England to France. My mother lived in England. Anyway, sad, sadness, loneliness, depression. Oh, my gosh, yes. Melancholy like you wouldn't believe. Feeling vulnerable or powerless. You are powerless. You don't know what's happening. You don't know what the social construct is. What are ethics? What are the, the norms that we use by which we interact and engage with one another? I can't even pick up the telephone. I don't speak the language that well. Speaking a foreign language on a telephone, tough. Let me just tell you. Anyway, okay, let's keep going. Change in temperament, feeling anger, irritability, resentment. Resentment was high for me. Resentment was high. Um, unwillingness to interact with others. Yes, you're feeling very isolated, very secluded. And again, you don't know what the norms are. You don't know what the expectations are. You're not confident in your language skills, at least for me when I was in France. So, yes, I felt this. Uh, feelings of being lost, overlooked, exploited, or abused. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where we get going, right? Developing negative stereotypes about the new culture. We're going to talk about this because this is a core aspect of culture shock. You look around and you see nothing but negative and you create these stereotypes. And finally, you idealize your own culture. Oh, in America, we would never do this. Oh, in America, we would never do that. Oh, in America, we do this, that, and the other. I was an apocalyptic pest when I was out there. Again, junior year of high school, guys. I was 15, 16 years old. Give me a break, right? But still, I felt this pretty strongly. All right. So why? Why do we experience culture shock, all right? Why does this happen? Well, here's the thing, guys. Whether consciously or otherwise, we expect everyone to be like us. 
We really do. Now, there's a reason for this, right? It's because of schemas. Now, let me explain what schemas are, right? Schemas are cognitive structures that help us to make sense of the world and orientate ourselves within our social surroundings, right? So it's kind of a mental map that we use to make sense of our social surroundings, our interactions, our norms, the values, the guiding principles and customs and so forth. It's this, this map that we form in our head. Totally unseen, right? It's like the matrix. You can't see the matrix, but it's everywhere. It's all around you, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, schemas, they inform and guide our interpretation of the past and present, as well as set expectations for the future, allowing us to anticipate the likely course a social encounter may take. Now, we have cultural schemas, right? I know that when I'm walking along and, and I enter a door and behind someone, the person in front of me is likely going to hold the door open. It's just a normal norm, right, in, say, this culture, right? And so I can predict the future. I can, you know, I can predict the future. I can make sense of the here and now, and I can predict what's going to happen. I know that when I'm driving and so forth, and I see a turn signal and somebody, you know, kind of swerving, I know to back off because that person wants in. I don't have to think about it. These are the constructs by which we engage with society. All right. Now, a way to think of of schemas is, you know, when you were a kid, you had that toy. It was a box that had the holes in it of, of a rectangle, a triangle, a circle, a square. And you had these blocks and you had to put the blocks in the right holes to get them inside this box. Well, that's kind of what schemas allow us to do. They they allow us to observe the environment and experience our interactions with one another, and then take these interactions and these perceptions and these observations and fit them into this box in a way that we have preconceived. We created that box, but that box was also highly influenced by our culture. So ultimately, schemas allow us to categorize our perceptions and experiences and then sort them according to the box we've created for ourselves. Okay, so we expect people to be like us. We just do, right? But here's the thing, folks, they're not. <laughs> people aren't like us, right? They're different. And so when we travel to another country or work with a different culture, we see there are differences. And when that happens, a cultural division occurs, okay? And there's just something different, right? But now here's the thing about there's something different, right? The way I do things, well, it's right. We do things the right way. And, and it's not that we have in our minds right or wrong. It's just if I do it this way, then by definition, it is the best way that I and my culture and my family and my surroundings and my school have determined it to be. Therefore, by some definition or another, the way I do things is right, right? Well, if you do things differently, well, then what's different than right? Well, wrong, of course. So we don't say, oh, that is a different way of doing it. We go, oh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a different way of approaching it, meaning I'm incredulous and I kind of put it on the wrong camp, right? Okay, well, now here's the deal, though. When this interaction of right and wrong clashes and we have a cultural divide, this brings about an emotional response. OK, it brings about anger, fear, disrespect, distrust, antagonism, loathing, you name it. It brings about an emotional response. OK, now here's the thing now, folks. This is normal. You have every license in the world 
to go through this process. This is a normal psychological response to clashing schemas. It's a normal psychological response. Um, and I've done it many times. But now here's the thing. It's at this point that we have a decision to make. We can take this normal response and channel it in one of two directions. Let me first tell you the wrong direction. And once again, in full disclosure, I am going to share with you, I have gone down the wrong path before. Once again, you put a 15, 16 year old in France all alone and yeah, he's going to go down an ugly path, right? Now, I came out of it. I'm okay, right? J'aime la France, right? But you're going to go down this once in a while, but you need to be aware. So let's talk about the wrong path to go down first. So when this cultural divide happens in our cultural schemas, and we have this emotional response, we create a false attribution about their behavior. Because here's the thing, we need to rationalize this behavior. I mean, if I do it right and they're doing it wrong, why on earth are they doing it wrong? We need to rationalize and explain why they do it this way. Well, the false attribution, what does that mean? Well, it means you don't know why they do it that way, but you're going to make crap up, right? You're not going to do the research. You're not going to ask questions. You're not going to delve. You're not going to explore. You're not going to investigate. You're not going to heuristically internally ask yourself, you know, in introspectively, how do I respond? No, no. We'll talk about this on the other side. You're going to make crap up. And the crap we make up is not normally very magnanimous. So this is where you hear things like, well, they're kind of a dirty people. And they're not really educated. It's kind of a backwards country. You know what? They're all greedy, you know, and you really can't trust them. They're all thieves and liars. And you know what? They're just not very civilized. And you've, you've heard these things. You have heard these things, and you may even have thought these things. I have. All right? So what happens as a result? Well, we discount them and withdraw from engagement. In other words, well, heck, if they're just a bunch of greedy thieves and, you know, kind of uneducated halfwits, I don't need to engage with them. I don't want to have anything to do with that. That's them, them and theirs country, man. I'm going to stay in my little sphere because in America, everything's off. Awesome. I'm in the U.S. right now, right? So everything's awesome here, right? Because we idealize our native culture and we don't have anything to do with them. And so we create this us versus them, in-group versus out-group. The in-group is so nuanced and sophisticated and thoughtful and deep, where those folks, they're all terrorists. They're all rapists and murderers. No, 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 no. That's the problem. Okay, folks, we don't want to do this. We don't want to do this. We don't want to do this. So what do we want to do instead? Okay, a cultural divide occurs. We feel an emotional response, what do we do? Well, first, become aware of your reaction. You know, now that might sound kind of obvious and simplistic, but the truth is we're not always super cognizant or aware of our emotional reactions. Uh, speaking for myself, I could be driving down the road and my thoughts will be going somewhere and so forth. And every once in a while, they go a negative way. And after a while, I realize my hands are tense, my shoulders are tense. I'm scowling and I'm upset. And it's kind of like, whoa, 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 where'd that come from, Lon? It did not become immediately obvious to me that I was having an emotional response. So the first thing we need to do is become aware of our reaction and then reflect on the causes. What did they do 
to make you feel this way, right? I mean, what what's the root issue? What's the root issue, okay? Um, because then you can kind of analyze things. Well, all right, now, now I at least know what the root issue is. I understand how I'm responding emotionally. Then you can kind of step back and let your reaction subside. Just chill out. Just step away a little bit. Give it the, the benefit of some time and space. But then you want to come back and observe and decode the cultural differences in the situation. So this means do some research, ask, explore, talk to people. Tell me about this cultural behavior. Why do they do this? Why do you do this? Um, what's the thought process behind this practice and this practice? Because when you look at all the myriad factors that comprise culture. We're talking things like religious, religion and political philosophy, economic philosophy, uh, history, the stories that they tell one another, the way we communicate and so forth. There are any number of ways that culture has influenced the way that we behave as a society. Research it, figure it out, talk to people, explore it, be open right? And, and kind of understand where they compare and contrast versus where there's actually some overlap, right? I've done this many times, and it's insanely fascinating what you learn. Now, as you learn and understand, what you're able to do is then develop a culturally appropriate set of expectations. In other words, when you go into a similar situation again, you know what to expect. It doesn't totally jar your schema anymore because what you're doing is you are rewiring your own schemas. You're cutting out new holes in that box and boring out old holes and really adjusting your expectations to be in greater alignment with your host culture there, okay? So, as I've said, I have gone through this countless times, and I thought about boring you with a story about when I was in India one time and buying, buying a sari for my daughter. I decided you're not going to stick around for that, so I'm not going to worry about it. But trust me when I say this works, this is beneficial, this is requisite for successful international business and relations. Okay, so there you go. You've got a competitive advantage now because you know how to better socialize with and collaborate with international folks and cultures better than other folks. All right. So take it, go off and do something awesome with it. And we'll talk to you later. Thanks a lot.